so uh, my name is Georgia Warnke. I am director of the Center for Ideas and Society. Um, and this is a, a part of our ongoing series called Hot Off the Presses. Uh, there's another um, uh, UC Humanity Center, which does something of the same sort of thing. That is a faculty who have recently published a book talk about the book. They have a better name though for theirs. They call it Books and Beer. <laughs> <laughs> but we're hot off the presses. Um, UCR faculty who have recently published a book typically talk about that book for maybe 30 to 40 minutes and then we open it up to questions. Uh, because we're online, we have a slightly different format for this. Um, uh, episode in the series uh, where uh, Deborah Wong, the author, will be um, interviewed by Sean Miora. Um, I am going to introduce Deb, Deborah, and then she will introduce Sean. Uh, first, however, I wanted to um, give just three advisory points. First, uh, the session is recorded. Uh, so that people that couldn't uh, sign on now will be get a chance to see it, listen to it. Um, so um, when you ask a question, you'll be recorded. Uh, there's also a chat function if you'd rather remain anonymous, uh, where you can ask questions and I'll be uh, looking at the chat. Um, stay muted unless you're asking a question, so that way we don't get a lot of background noise. Um, and when you have a question, raise your hand. If you look to the right, if you haven't done this before, there should be a raise. If you click on participants, uh, you should see a raise hand, your hand function. Um, or you can ask a question through chat and I'll be checking the chat uh, to raise those questions. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Deborah Wong, who most of you know, but that's what I do is director of the center, I introduce people to people who already know the person. Um, Deborah Wong is an ethnomusicologist and professor of music here at UCR. She specializes in the musics of Asia, Asian America and Thailand and has written three books. The first is the one we're gonna hear about today, Louder and Faster, Pain, Joy and the Body Politic in Asian American Taiko. Um, but previous books uh, include Speak It Louder, Asian Americans Making Music and Sounding the Center, History and Aesthetics in Thai Buddhist Ritual. She's past president of the Society for Ethnomusicology and she's series editor for Wesleyan University Press's Music Culture Series and serves on the editorial boards of the journals Ethnomusicology, Women in Music, Asian Music and the Yearbook for Traditional Music. She's also curator of the new Asian Pacific America series for Smithsonian Folkways. She's very active in public sector work at the national, state, and local levels. And she recently completed a term as chair of the advisory council for the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. So, and she, as I said, she was gonna be talking about louder and faster, pain, joy, and the body politic in Asian American Taiko. Mm -hmm. And here she is to introduce Sean. Yeah. Thank you, Georgia. And thank you for the series, you know, and all for all of the, the magic and, and camaraderie of, of the center, right? I think so many of us really depend on the Center for Ideas and Society at UCR, you know, for, for fellowship, you know, and for a safe space where we can focus on our work and one another. Uh, but let me introduce Sean, Sean Miura. Um, who I have long admired and just like so enjoy spending time with. Let me give you the, the bio that, that, that he wrote and then I want to, you know, make it a little more personal. Um, Sean Miura is a Los Angeles based writer and arts organizer and as far as I know he's sitting in his home in um, LA at the moment. He is the producer and lead curator for Tuesday Night Cafe, the oldest Asian American public art series in the nation. His writing has appeared in publications and outlets like the Harvard Asian American Policy Review, Nerds of Color, and Reappropriate. He has studied shamisen as part of the Sawai Koto Academy and the Mitsuri Sasaki Sangenkai and has performed and recorded as a member of Nobuko Miyamoto's Motai Nai Band and he currently works at BuzzFeed in creative strategy. And I've gotten to know um, Sean um, through shared circles and you know, over the, the last 
five, six, seven, I don't know how many years. Yeah, um, I don't know how many years it's been. Yeah, I forget when I first sort of became aware of you, but it's been a while. Um, you know, I mean, I it, it became very clear to me that, that um, you know, we're from a different generations, you know, and, and I was just so impressed by Sean's... Um, He's so articulate. He's so historically and politically informed. And he's, you know, doing the work. That's with a capital W. He's doing the work, you know, at the community level and is deeply uh, committed to and invested in um, the present and the past, present and future, really, of, of the Japanese American community. He does a lot of great work in Little Tokyo in particular. If you haven't been to Tuesday Night Cafe, you must go, of course, you know, on hiatus right now, but um, it takes place uh, April through October, right? Um, in the courtyard of the East West Players in Little Tokyo. And it's um, an incredible, vibrant space where Asian American arts, uh, from writing to film to music to dance, you know, you name it, uh, takes place. And a lot, of, a lot of it is due to Sean's incredible extended circle. I've also seen Sean um, serve as MC for like, you know, the Japanese American National Museum gala fundraiser, <laughs> speaking to a thousand people and getting everybody all sort of revved up and, you know, opening their wallets. Asking for money, yeah. Amazing. Um, and we also, uh, three, four years ago, I forget, uh, went to Washington, D.C. and spent a very intense week together um, um, performing in the um, Smithsonian Folklife Festival. And that's particularly where we got to know each other. So, Sean, thank you so much for, for doing this. You know, no, I mean, showing up. At, the, at, the risk, at the risk of this becoming a, a true Asian American thing and we just compliment each other for an hour and a half. Like, I, I really am... Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. Your work is so impactful on, I think, the way that we all understand Asian American music and then by extension culture and communities. Um, and I, I know that your work has been like incredibly impactful on folks like, for example, our friend Richie Amenchev as a tractivist who is, is shaping, I think, a lot of the conversation now online mm -hmm. about Asian American music and your, your documentation of our community is so thorough and you are capturing things that I don't think many people think to capture. So um, to be here is a total, a huge honor. The ask was, was totally unexpected and, and, and I'm, I'm grateful to be here and humbled. But uh, we have a, a long amount of time to talk, which is probably going to turn <laughs> to a very short amount of time, uh, knowing how much you and I like to talk. But um, <laughs> I, I guess like just to, to start, so today we are... Um, as, as, as Georgia mentioned earlier, we we're talking about your book right here, uh, Loud mm -hmm. and Faster, Pain, Joy, and the Body Politic in American, Asian American Taiko. Um, I, I think most people on this call probably under, like, have, have a sense for what Taiko is or know what Taiko is or are practitioners themselves. But I'm wondering if you can just start um, walking us through the, the tradition, the Taiko tradition that you're focusing on in this book. Um, it's the term, the word Taiko, is used in a number of different forms. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you can just like, like locate us really quick. Oh, sure. And I'll try to, you know, provide the, the short story, right? Um, and I'm wonderfully aware that there's any number of people present right now who could as well offer this, you know, definition in history. But um, um, I'm writing about a contemporary tradition called Kumi Daiko, or, you know, group or ensemble Taiko. Um, it's, it's decidedly a post-World War II phenomenon. And in fact, it emerged under precisely those conditions of, in Japan, of um, young uh, cultural activists, really, Japanese cultural activists coming together and um, uh, wanting to think and talk about the rapid westernization that was taking place with the American occupation, right? And um, they turned to, um, you know, uh, these these drums, you know, that were already very much part of um, Japanese Shinto and Buddhist ritual practice. Um, you know, there's also a, a Japanese um, founding father um, who was a jazz drummer, not at all a traditional musician uh, in Japan, who then turned to taiko as well. So there was this moment in the 1940s and 50s when kumidaiko came together. It came to North America in, in 1969, with the arrival of a particular teacher, um, Tanaka Sensei, uh, Tanaka Seichi. And he is still very much alive and uh, created a dojo or a school in San Francisco, which remains very important, you know, foundational. Um, many uh, North American taiko lineages can be traced directly from him and his students. Um, but it spread then in a matter of years, uh, 
particularly through Sansei or third generation Japanese Americans, who at that point were um, getting woke. They were they had come to political consciousness. They were thinking about uh, the Asian American movement and were participating in it. And so a number of other groups began to appear through the the 1970s. Um, around the year, um, Taiko has always been very community based. You know, is is part of of you know the my point of fascination in particular. Around the year 2000, the phenomenon exploded. Taiko became very, very, very popular, and groups began to appear like literally by the week. I, at this point, I almost feel like it's by the day. There's like, you know, there's so many um, kumidaiko groups at this point, and not just in North America or in Japan at this point, also in Latin America, also in Western Europe in particular, also in Australia and New Zealand. I should quickly say that taiko is not everywhere. In fact, it has followed very decided first world paths of, um, of need and dissemination. Um, you know, so it's it's an absolutely vibrant phenomenon. That's probably what's so interesting about it. I mean, we often talk about tradition as if it's something that has to be protected and preserved, yeah. right? You know, you know, coddled. You know, taiko, not at all. I mean, it's you know, it's it's traditional. It's new and it's old. It's traditional. It's contemporary. It's continuing to to stretch and to expand. And and you know, I mean, it's just like that's why it's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, how do you come to Taiko then? So I, I know that you're obviously like you are a scholar in the field. Um, your first book is about um, Bangkok really and it's all kind of set in Asia, in Thailand. Um, how do you find yourself in Taiko and for you is your relationship with it as an Asian art or as an Asian American art? Like what's your first kind of understanding of Taiko? As an Asian American art. Yeah, yeah. Um, I first saw Kumidaiko performed live in um, the mid 1990s. Um, in fact, I was in Philadelphia and um, San Jose Taiko came through mm. and performed. And I was already on a path beginning in the well, 1990 or so, I was on a path of moving towards uh, away from Southeast Asian studies per se and more towards um, Asian American studies. Uh, I was hungry for. Asian American cultural expression. I was hungry for uh, Asian American community. Uh, so there I was in Philadelphia involved in other Asian American community efforts, um, especially the Asian Arts Initiative, which remains vibrant. Um, and then San Jose Taiko came through and I was just like, I had the response that many other Taiko they have had as well that first seeing a taiko group perform as an asian american seeing other asian americans being so loud and graceful and physical and emphatic you know mm -hmm. in public <laughs> um it was it was profoundly moving i mean it brought me to tears basically and i just wanted to learn it i wanted to learn it so when i moved to southern california in 1996 um one of the first things i did was to go in search of a teacher a group and I found uh, the Taiko Center of Los Angeles and Reverend Tom Kurai, my teacher. And there are many people here listening right now who um, knew him, studied with him, um, you know, uh, remain in some disbelief that he passed away in 2018. He was our teacher at UCR for many years. That's beautiful. And so um, you joined this group. Um, at, what point, at what point do you go, aha, there's a, there's a book here? Like what sort of, how did, how, did, how, did you, how did it sort of turn from this like interest to an academic pursuit? Yeah, it's a great question. To be very clear, I didn't start there. I didn't go to Tycho thinking I need me a research topic. <laughs> no, I need to be very clear. I went in search of Tycho to feed my soul, you know, to feed my, um, you know, to feed my, my need for Asian American community connection, right? Um, so it was several years down the line. I'm an ethnomusicologist and that doesn't, you know, get turned off, right? I mean, it's always in there percolating. Um, it's part of how I view the world, um, you know. So, of course, I was thinking as an ethnomusicologist, even as I was having profound experiences, profound sweaty experiences, you know, as a Taiko student. Um, so it's several years in, you know, that I really... Um, you know, I was asking Reverend Tom questions all the time anyway, and it, it sort of morphed into actually having and asking him to if I could record him while we had a conversation. And then, you know, it was it was a, it was a additive. The actions were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what did you did Asian American um, 
like music as a study interest pop up earlier than that? Or was it really just a, like, was your, was your relationship to Asian America very much more about that hunger and that need that you were talking about? Oh, well, they're both, they're one and the same for me. <laughs> um, I was already following quote unquote Asian American music scenes by, by the early 1990s. Actually, as I was, yeah, 1990, as I was writing my dissertation, you know, so that's when I started to follow, you know, John Jang and Francis Wong and Mark Izu and all the Bay Area, you know, uh, free improv. Yeah musicians, Mia Masaoka, you know, in Philadelphia, then in the mid 90s, trying to sort of follow the Asian American hip hop scene with the Mountain Brothers, um, you know, the stuff that ended up in my second book, largely. Um, so, you know, that was already there before Tycho kind of grabbed me by the throat. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that it's, it is kind of this interesting thing where we, we kind of hunger for, um, to, to, to see ourselves reflected in culture. And then in like that hunger, that hunger slowly turns into to like a more like deeper interest and then that interest turns into just like an entire life um so <laughs> yeah. like like for you are you are you still like for in terms of like your focus now like is asian america kind of where your your study is or are you still thinking about like larger global global connections and like asian america as like a global kind of like like as as, as, a, as we start to globalize that term a little bit more oh absolutely um I don't actively have one project that I can say this is my Asian American research at this point. Um, but as you know, I'm, I'm, you know, immersed, deeply embedded with uh, Nobuko Miyamoto's work in, in LA. Um, you know, the Fandango Obon project, which brings together um, Japanese American and East LA uh, Chicanx uh, communities. Um, you know, so the work continues in short, um, without as um, focused or deliverable as saying, I'm writing a book about X, Y, and Z. You know, I'm not sure where it's going to take me at the moment. But I want to circle back for a moment here because I, I've told you from the beginning, I want us to have a conversation. We've like barely talked about your book. Why are we already talking about me? Because I want to know when you, you know, I mean, actually, you all should know that I've had Sean come in and, and speak as a, a, you know, a guest speaker in my course on Asian American music that I offer every three years or so, you know, so I've heard him sort of give his, his, his chair, his story, you know, in a kind of sustained way. But do you have a moment, Sean, where you kind of came to consciousness? You know, I mean, I, I have this sense that it was just always there for you. Um, you know, I've heard you talk about your childhood. As an Asian American, I, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it, 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 it's it's definitely. I think, as my my aunt put, puts it, it was in the air. Um, I, yeah. I grew up in a family where our bookshelf was always stacked with Asian American literature. Um, I think my mom was mm. actually in the Zoom. Hi, mom. Um, and so I, I was sort of able to, like the the first books that I was reading, like what I was learning, I was cutting my like literally learning to read by reading like Journey to Topaz by Yoshiko Uchida. Or like Holy baseball cow. saved us by Ken Mochizuki. So um, sure. that was kind of just in the air. But really, uh, with nine eleven, um, we had just moved to New Jersey, and uh, that moment of intense nationalism followed by, um, well, coupled with intense racism and and then um, racialized violence and, and murder. Um, that for me was really the moment that flipped the switch and contextualized like my own family's history of incarceration. Um, during World War II in a much broader sense of like the systems that are in place and sort of how um, these things happen, right. um, how racism happens. And so I think that in that, in that moment, uh, that, that's when I really came to understand my own relationship to, to race um, and my own location within like a larger American context, um, mm -hmm. which then just made me, turn me into this like angry Asian teenager who was like on the internet and, and reading reading and everything I could about Asian America and then eventually moved to LA. Um, so yeah, it's so, so I think like that's mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. reading your book was really interesting to me because it, it, it's very, very much about Tycho as a, like in a historical context and in a cultural context, um, but it's very much rooted in your own experience. Um, so to, to flip this back to you, to totally deflect, we can go back to me a bit, <laughs> but um, I, I am wondering if you can tell us a little bit about like, what your approach was in writing this book and like i think it is so you weave yourself into it so seamlessly and you use yourself as kind of like a um almost like a, a place to locate like a small concept that then zooms out to something much larger um i'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about like 
again, like coming into the book, like what your intention was and then where you ended up and how, what, what that looked like. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, thanks for asking that. Um, uh, writing in that way is not something that I invented. This is something that's out there and, and you know, I, what I would consider to be the, the best contemporary ethnographic work, whether it's in ethnomusicology or anthropology or wherever, because ethnographic work is done in many disciplines. Um, but it's simply called, you know, positioned work where you, uh, you know, write from, um, you know, a location of understanding that you make clear. You know, you don't write in an, you know, omniscient voice. Uh, you write in the first person. Um, you make clear what your relationships are with uh, the people that you depict or interact with on the page. Um, you know, so I, I, I this, is, this is a way of writing um, that um, many, many people use. Um, and I had any number of amazing uh, models for this as I proceeded, you know, and I named pretty much all of them in the text itself because that's part of, part of how we do this kind of work is to acknowledge uh, the connections and the indebtedness of both our methods and our ideas, right? Um, so to be clear, I mean, I use what's called autoethnography in the book at times, you know, but this is not a book about me. This is not a book about, you know, me learning Tycho. That pops up at certain moments, but always in the service of um, something bigger that I'm after, you know? But, but I, think, I think it's really powerful though, the way that you use yourself mm -hmm. in like talking, for example, um, I mean, the, fir the first word in the subhead on your title is pain and you, you locate mm -hmm. pain in your body and that really gives the reader a really it, it, it you do then zoom out from that of course mm. but um i thought that was a really I, I know that this as you said this is something that is used but i thought that that was a really effective way of doing things and i think part mm. of the reason why that may have been so impactful for me is that in, in asian american communities i think that we we so often try to depersonalize a lot of our writing so as not to offend anybody mm. and not to be like oh and not not to like inadvertently call somebody out or make somebody think oh did, did Deborah write that about me like is this yeah is this about um and so I I am wondering yeah. like um in, in your approach like was there a moment when you like did, did you walk into it knowing that you were going to write it from that positioning um like as an I did I absolutely did oh yeah because there's no alternative <laughs> I mean you know literally um and not not least because of the importance of positioned work, but also because I wanted to do honor and respect to the specific scene that I, you know, had the privilege of, of being part of, of witnessing over many years. Um, so it had to be specific in particular, um, you know, and sometimes named using real names and sometimes not, you know, according to the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beverly Murata appears gonna, very was, much by name. I was going to say, I took, a quick, look at the, I took a quick look at the, the participant <laughs> list and recognize the, recognize the name. Yeah. Of yeah. Like, you know, one of my favorite parts of the book is, is where she goes through uh, on video. Thank you so much, Beverly, for allowing me to include this. I ask her to go through uh, the contents of her bag of Tycho gear. And we're in the van and we've come, we're in the middle of going home from a Tycho performance, you know, actually three days of Tycho performances. Reverend Tom's driving. Beverly's in the front seat. Um, and I ask her to go through the Tycho bag and I you know I write about her you know and what she has and why um, later in the book you know she is part of an interview that appears in transcript um, where we talk about in fact pain um, yeah you know so so in many cases I'm writing about my friends right you know my Tycho friends what's that like for you mm -hmm. writing about writing about your friends how does what what does that process look like to you a little scary, right? <laughs> right? You know, because, um, and of course, I shared what I wrote about people course, with right. them, you know, before I, you know, like dropped it into a paperback. Um, yeah, you know, I think I did a, a careful job of, of um, being dialogic about it is the term we use um, in ethnography, um, where we not only write the encounter, but then we share what we've written and we write about how that conversation went and and at a certain level of course what the dialogic suggests is that the conversation never ends and that the act of representing and re-representing just keeps going it's open-ended right yeah. so yeah 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 um i i know you mentioned that you were interested in maybe reading a little bit 
for us? Is that something that you'd be interested in? Uh, yeah, not too much because letting us know, you, letting can us read, you can read for yourselves. I mean, any requests? Uh, <laughs> I, I whatever whatever feels good to you. There are there are a number of things that I I love that you did in the book, but yeah. I think whatever whatever you're feeling in the on this Friday morning. Oh, let me see here. Um, I think from the conclusions, you know, again, unless nobody's put anything in chat, like, huh, page, whatever. Um, from the, the conclusions, and I'll keep this to just a few minutes. Um, my personal disappointments are real enough. The Taiko community doesn't like to talk about its own gender inequities. The majority of Taiko groups are led by men, despite the fact that the majority of players are women. Though this might be changing, we'll see. The acceptance of heterosexist hierarchy sometimes means that older men are automatically elevated to positions of authority and leadership. Deep habits of silence, despite the noisiness of our work, mean that we rarely call out Orientalist practices, even when confronted by them. This book is situated in the broader project of anti-racist scholarship. It is not about race, ethnicity, and gender in Tycho. My questions centrally concern these matters, but I hope that my critical emphasis on difference is so fundamentally attentive to them that they cannot isolate or contain my work. Uh, skipping over some great quotes. Um, so that was necessarily my starting point rather than where I have arrived. And I paraphrase George Lipsitz, who paraphrases Ruthie, Gil uh, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore to say that this book is about, quote, the fatal couplings of power and difference, unquote, that shape lives and slingshot drums across oceans, wars, and time. Um, this book is less celebratory than it would have been had I written it after one year or three years or five years of passionate involvement with Tycho. I'm both frustrated and inspired by Tycho. I sometimes sound skeptical and even cynical in this book because my hopes are so high. In some places, Taiko does urgently important things for some Japanese Americans and other Asian Americans, both performers and audience members. And certainly it shows how community-based expressive culture complicates what uh, Lan Kurashige has called the continuum between the poles of victimization and resistance. I write at a historical moment of political disaster when the progressive left is demoralized yet regrouping, and many wonder what new and old violence, hate, and hurt are coming our way. Immigrants, both legal and less than legal, are terribly vulnerable. White men march in the streets with torches. Nativism drowns out other voices. The pain and injuries of U.S. history are not metaphorical right now, and the loudness of Asian American Tycho speaks in a context of xenophobic noise. The, the insistent volume of Japanese American and other Asian American drumming is absolutely needed in this environment of real and present danger. And this is no retreat to ethnic nationalism. Rather, I've shown in this book that Taiko is an example of how racial projects appear from sometimes unexpected places and sources. So that's from the conclusions. Ooh. That's quite a conclusion, quite a conclusion. I remember writing it and I actually literally wrote it at the end. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I report for the deadline. I think that that's a. I mean, that's a. That's a really beautiful way. I think to close out the book because it does. It does sum up sort of like all these different threads that you're tracing throughout the text. Um, I, I have. I have uh, some more questions, but just to invite the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I don't know if I'm pointing at the chat box. I think it's down here. Um, <laughs> it's here. But uh, or it's over here. Just chat box, and we will. We'll use those as jumping points, please. Please let us know what you're thinking. Please, folks. I'm looking at all of your names and faces. I don't know every single <laughs> one of you, but I know many of you. I see that there's, you know, like a, a pioneer Tycho players. Hello, Linda Hoffman. Um, um, you know, I'm I'm seeing friends and colleagues from um, from UCR. You know, I'm seeing some of my graduate students. I'm I'm seeing alumni uh, from UCR. I'm seeing quite a few ethnomusicologists. You know, so so at any any level, um, I would invite your thoughts questions questions yeah. are good yeah. um you in that passage you read you talked about um how it would be it would be like a maybe a sunnier conclusion if you had written it like a few years after you had started and yeah. that actually reminds me you have this um this really great uh phrase in your earlier essay um Tycho in america from speak it louder oh. um, where you say you talk about vanishing into the act of learning music uh, oh, yeah. And it's it's interesting because 
Um, I read, I actually read it backwards. I, I well, I, I reread Taiko in America after I read, read Asian Taiko. America, Taiko in Asian America. Taiko in Asian America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, sorry. Um, but I, I had, I had read Speak It Louder years ago and reread it after um, reading Louder and Faster. And it was, what struck me was in Louder and Faster, you, you do have this like very, uh, the, 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 this, this, this lens, the, this, this perspective where you're going into all the crevices and really exploring and really questioning and pushing back on, on tradition, but then also like reaffirming tradition, et cetera. Um, but in that earlier essay, you really do speak to like vanishing into that, into like the art and vanishing into the teaching. Um, what was your journey? I, I'm so curious, like what your journey was between that first essay and this book and sort of like your own oh. understanding of Tycho. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, quite a few years passed between that one chapter on Tycho that appears in Speak It Louder. And then of course the book, you know, um, the Tycho book, quite a few years passed. And in fact, um, my earliest writing and publications on Tycho were in fact pretty celebratory. I was completely in just in, you know, in love with, with the actual uh, productive generative work that Tycho was very clearly doing for any number of, of, of Asian Americans, you know, I was spending time with. Um, so I was very much just sort of wrapped up in that for the longest time. And I, I don't regret a minute of it because, it, you know, I, I see many musicians and performers, you know, and, and even are gathering here today. Um, and without romanticizing it, I can say that in many forms of performance, something very special happens in, in terms of blurring of subjectivities and, um, you know, the ability to step out of um, an enclosed sense of self and, you know, um, certain kinds of connection can be possible through performance. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not this kind of, you know, romantic, you know, 19th century idea right. about, you know, transcendent. That's ah, not where I'm coming from. You know, so, so performance can enable some pretty amazing shifts in, in understanding and awareness um, and sense of self. But what happens often in my feeling, especially through Tycho and um, um, intentionally community-based, community-building forms of performance, um, is that new collectivities emerge out of that. And for me, that, that is what's so important. That is what is essential, not just that I end up feeling you know, having a different idea about myself as an individual, yeah. but that new collectivities emerge. Talk, talk a little think? bit about that. I know you think what, what do you, what do you, can, can you explode that a little bit? What do you mean by, like, what, why is that important and what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, literally when people in the 50s and 60s would sing, we shall overcome, something happened as a result. It, you know, and this is like a key kind of theoretical, um, 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 what um, world changing con construct that comes out of performance studies. Um, the performative is the shorthand term for it. Um, that performance is never just reflecting reality. It's not just holding up a mirror to uh -huh. reality, but it is literally sometimes at least generating um, new possibilities and even new realities, uh -huh. right? So that performance at the performative is creating something new. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think if we think about art as long-term process, right? Like a painting is not just a painting. A painting is the result of a lifetime of painting um, mm. and a lifetime of examination. Then that performance marks a moment. It is, it is, it is a product of that process, um, but is always then recontributing to that longer, longer term process and, um, and growth yeah. of the artist and, and the community. So yeah, I, I, yeah. That, that's really interesting, but that's really interesting. Um, and I, I wonder then how you apply that to yourself, like in thinking Constantly about- Constantly every day. <laughs> but like, how, but like, are there other specific things that like, like realizations you had along the way about Tycho or things that you realized were, were like, like, like what was that reflective process like for you? I think that there, I think that oftentimes we do think about the, the performer or the artist of, of having, as having a static relationship with their work. Oh, I see what you're asking. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, my journey continues. Um, you know, I'm actually not making music right now, which is, you know, just wrong. I'm not making any kind of music right now. It's just, it's not good. Um, but it is wrong. <laughs> but, but, I, <laughs> but I would argue that, um, 
And I haven't played taiko since 2009. I mean, I haven't been an active member of a taiko group. I have played taiko, but um, I haven't been a member of a group since 2009. Um, and I've said continuously that I'm going to come back to it. Um, I still have that intent. Um, because, because, because. Um, there's, first of all, there's several ways to be involved with performance and to make the performative part of one's life, right? And just sitting around and literally making music on an instrument is only one of many, many different ways. You know, as an ethnomusicologist, I really think that um, listening to music and enjoying music and following music and all of those things is a perfectly fine way of, 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 of living musically. Right. right, you know, yeah. a profoundly important way of living musically. And I know a few people that don't do that, right? So that suggests that most people are living musically, you know, in various ways. Um, so that's where I think things get really interesting. And I continue to live musically. Um, I also continue to be very actively part of the um, um, Obon dance scene in, in, in Los Angeles, um, the Bonodori summertime ritual dance scene, uh, for instance, you know, so this is a very active way that I consider myself very much part of the taiko slash Bonodori scene. Um, I just participated in a remote Bonodori uh, a couple nights ago in my living room. They were all in Hawaii um, and danced for half an hour and it was great. And I actually felt the presence of community. Yeah, I've actually been listening to Obon music while I work. It's kind of been this funny. Really? Yeah, it's, it's a funny moment. Um, we'd, lo we'd love to come back to this this conversation. I think that we're. I I, I think that there there's something interesting about that that notion of living musically. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think that we oftentimes in the 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 capitalist world that we are in, like we mm -hmm. we we see production as proof of value and proof of of um, of process uh, when really process is, pro is proof of process. So, um, but there are a few questions in the chat, so I want to make sure that oh. we address those. So first of all, uh, Jorge Kalaf is asking about your shirt. Can you tell us a little oh. bit about the t-shirt you're wearing? Jorge, thank you for coming. One of our graduate students in the music PhD program. Um, this is not one of my famous Taiko shirts. I love that section of my book. May I just say, is that weird to say? I love that section of my no, book. No, no, we, we all do that. Don't worry about it. You can love your book too. But the section on t-shirts was so much fun to write and so much fun to realize how many gosh darn Taiko t-shirts I had in my closet and, and then to begin asking other people and so on and so forth. But no, this is not one of them. <laughs> uh, this is um, actually um, very much a current scene that I'm part of with Nobuko Miyamoto. And uh, Great Leap is her um, nonprofit arts organization in Los Angeles. Yeah, so this is sort of the way in which my Taiko journey has taken me into other um, Asian American arts efforts. Yeah, so I meant I very much chose to wear this today. Yeah, it's a good shirt. It's a good I shirt. Think so yeah, yeah. Lo love a little love some Great Leap. And then uh, they'll we're, we are currently. So to speak to that, there's a Great Leap is releasing a music video for Bambutsu Otsunagari, which will be coming out later for Today for Solidarity, I believe, so in June. Um, Could you, before we turn to another question, yep. tell us more about Tsuru for Solidarity. And in fact, I'm going to be playing in the big, you know, remote taiko, you know, Tsurumin Matsuri. See, you're, you are living music. Like, you're, I am. you're, you're saying you're not playing taiko, <laughs> but then I just, it, it's, I, I feel like that's a lie. Um, <laughs> don, suku, don, 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 see, suku, there we don, go. Don, da, yeah, totally. It's happening okay. right now. Yeah, but um, tell us about Tsuru for Solidarity. So Tsuru for Solidarity is a uh, convening gathered by, uh, initiated by many folks who are so, who have been worked with, like, um, the Tudor Lake Pilgrimage, which is a pilgrimage to a former a World War II concentration camp that was largely populated with Japanese American resistors. Um, mm -hmm. It is also folks who have organized like the Crystal City um, pilgrimages and, and sort of the, these actions that were where Japanese Americans were organized to physically show up at um, sites where uh, families who had immigrated to America were being held as prisoners um, under, this new, under this administration. Um, and so out of that came this call for a um, gathering, a convening called Tsudu for Solidarity, which in the Tsudu means cranes, um, in this case referring to the folded Oritsudu, the origami cranes. Um, and so the original idea behind it, uh, spearheaded by a group of people, but largely Satsuki Ina, an incredible organizer, um, child psychologist, thinker, compassionate person, um, was to convene in Washington, uh, 
in May, I believe. I think it was May. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was well, I think actually next weekend or, you know, next anyway. Weekend, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. the idea was to convene, obviously, um, given the state of the world, uh, it was pushed, but there is still going to be a gathering in June. I'm, I'm um, not clear on the details, so I would suggest everybody look it up. We'll put the information in the chat. But um, as part of City for Solidarity, there is a art component. Um, mm. And so uh, Nobuko Miyamoto, who is the, the, the founder of Great Leap, um, and then the artist that Deborah was talking about, um, legendary singer-songwriter, um, former dancer on Broadway. You can see her in the West Side Story movie. <laughs> uh, she has, I, we were, I, was, I was chatting with her the other day and she casually started talking about that one time she was in a play opposite Danny Glover. Like she's just an, an amazing, an amazing person overall. Mm -hmm. um, and she has been orchestrating this large um, bone dance kind of gathering celebration thing over video, um, utilizing the song uh, Bambutsu no Tsunagari, which was written in conjunction with Quetzal Flores, uh, the band Quetzal. And uh, it's a bilingual contemporary obon song. Um, and so that, that's kind of what, what Suda for Solidarity is in the, the macro. Yeah, the plan was to you know, perform in front of the White House, right? You know, um, yeah. yeah, to have a huge Bonodori circle in front of the White House. Yeah. Were you, are you going to play, are you, were you going to play Shami yeah, Sinema? So yeah, so I, I recorded my, my part. Mm -hmm. I awkwardly a, like Shami Sensing to the track uh, last weekend. Um, wonderful. Messed up a lot. We'll see how it goes. Luckily, they'll be dubbing <laughs> over it with the actual audio, so we'll be fine. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just keep an eye out Can't for that. Wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. Yeah. Um, all right. Chat is blowing up. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, whew, these are very thorough questions. I love it. They're long. Okay. Um, from Izumi Sakamoto. Um, uh, I'm curious to hear what kinds of responses you have had or not from the Taiko community about sexism, heterosexism, orientalism, etc. It's glaring in some places, which is infuriating. But like you said, these power dynamics are often are not often called out, at least in public spaces, despite the efforts in different spaces to discuss and support those who are subjugated. So um, what kind of responses have you had to like surfacing questions around like sexism, heterosexism, orientalism? Um, yeah. you, talk, you talk a little bit about how Taiko is shifting from this understanding of it as being Asian American art to a more um, kind of neutral sort of space almost mm -hmm, um, in your book mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. wow izumi like what a great question and um you know some uh you know what uh that you care about this question that's what i'm feeling and um i clearly you know um you're asking but i think you're also saying that that you know these conversations don't happen as much as perhaps they could uh I, I tend to, to politically, I tend to most of the time um, be an idealist. And I think that, that, that actually these conversations have been coming more consistently and, and in a more sustained manner in the past few years, um, especially since the Women in Taiko uh, workshop took place uh, uh, two and a half, three years ago now. Um, and that, that group you know, began to articulate real aims for um, the community through the Taiko Community Alliance, for instance, you know, structural changes around gender. Um, Izumi, are you a member of Raging Asian Women in Toronto? I, I'm a board member. I was with WOW for 10 years and I'm with a different group, Ishin Daiko. Yeah. Uh -huh. wow. I thought yeah. so. <laughs> uh, as part of the channel. Okay. okay. I, I, I'm so excited about that in August, right? Um, yeah, so Izumi is, uh, has been a board member for, member of, you know, one of the all Asian women feminist taiko groups, Raging Asian Women, raw in short. Yeah, which like, I am totally fangirl about that group. <laughs> and I've had, you know, like pictures, you know, of, of you all like, you know, on my wall. Um, yeah, because the work is so important and you articulated a whole set of possibility, um, you know, that, that wasn't taking place at that point when the group first came together, right? You know, I feel like it's now more possible because of, of the kinds of, you know, emphatic position that, that your group took. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> you should answer it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's much more to be said, as you can imagine, but, but um, Carlos Cortez, are you still here? Yeah. Where are you? Oh, wait, I still don't see Carlos. Oh, he's, um, his video's not on. Um, Carlos, you asked, uh, could I address the relationship of Tycho to what I refer to as uh, capitalist multiculturalism? There you are, hi. Um, and you say, this fascinates me because I just finished giving a two-hour webinar on inclusive curriculum for a religious organization, touching on some related issues like cultural appropriation. Whew. Well, everyone, Carlos Cortez is um, a, a, a legend and, a, and a, um, you know, a, what? An incredible force in the Riverside community and far beyond, um, and has long argued um, at the level of city government and sort of um, civic engagement, you know, for a, um, a more multicultural city and a, a clearer understanding of, of how Riverside needs those conversations, right? So he's led the way. Um, capitalist multiculturalism, again, not my idea. Um, I know you've, you've written about, you know, that as well on your own. Um, but what I mean by it is that um, in the 1990s, and especially, um, um, multiculturalism emerged as a way to sort of decenter the canon. It was a way that um, higher education was transformed from the inside out in terms of leaving behind, you know, ideas about, um, you know, uh, canonic great literature, um, um, you know, standard histories, um, but rather shook all that up. But what happened almost right away, as you know, uh, was that, um, um, multiculturalism was then sort of folded back into uh, the very structures of capitalist control, right? And, um, you know, became things like workshops uh, that would sort of take care of, of um, inclusion, diversity, and multiculturalism in a matter of a two-hour handy-dandy, you know, seminar kind of thing. Um, in short, it became a way capitalist multiculturalism or corporate multiculturalism as a way to uh, contain um, the real transformative forces of, of um, what drives multiculturalism as a political uh, principle. You know that already. I feel really weird about um, putting it out there like that. Um, but I'm fascinated that you were just doing this for a religious organization. You know, so clearly Carlos Cortez is still out there doing, doing the work and in a face-to-face, person-to-person kind of way. Yeah. So obviously Carlos, do you want to... How do you see Tycho? How do you see Tycho playing into that? All right, Tycho, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I write about it in the book, as as you clearly know. Um, what what happens so easily and so consistently is that Tycho then gets folded back into um, often uh, presentational. Uh, environments where it's convenient to have difference performed in one way or another. Um, and sometimes the ways in which this is taking place um, cynically and opportunistically versus ways in which still serves a community, sometimes those things are all in there together. You know, I cannot tell you in my 12 active years with the Tycho Center of LA, um, how many um, sort of festivals we performed in, you know, multicultural festivals that we performed in here, there, and everywhere in SoCal, um, in which the staging was all put together by a city, you know, often with a corporate sponsor like Target or whoever. Um, and at that level, structurally, one could absolutely say that we had been just, you know, sort of uh, folded back into uh, the most cynical kinds of, of, of multicultural um, effort. On the other hand, you know, there are actual people there too, you know, people who came in search of, of you know, who came with curiosity, who come with interest, with a desire to, um, to reach outside of familiar, you know, zones, right? Um, so I'm very aware that, that all those things are usually going on at the same time, you know, but one of my long-term worries about Tycho is that it is consistently pulled back into this kind of, you know, well, let's, let's bring on some Tycho players and have some, you know, ethnic color you know, for a few yeah. minutes. And then let's go back to business as usual. So then I guess to circle back to Izumi's question a little bit, like how, what kind of conversations, like have you had this conversation? Like in those 12 active years, was this a conversation that came up? Was this something that, like what, what was the general vibe of that, that discourse? The general vibe depends on who you're 
talking to, of course, you know, I mean, and you know that it's in the book that we talked about it within my group. Um, you know, there are real, real tensions in terms of some groups have like extended sort of egalitarian democratic processes for making decisions about what kinds of gigs to take and whatnot. You know, um, I would say that TCLA did not have that kind of process, um, but we still talked about it often with Reverend Tom. Um, after several particularly <laughs> egregious performances, you know, <laughs> where, really, you know, I actually <laughs> really enjoyed reading about that. Yeah, the two that you outlined. Yeah. We had amazing conversations, right? You know, and so my my feeling is that um, change and um, coming to consciousness is is a continual process for many of us, including taiko players including asian american taiko players right yeah like what what i guess for you as somebody who is thinking about all these things at at at, at once and, and at the same time like for you in those 12 years what what kept bringing you back when you would do like a show that just was it, like it wasn't it wasn't just like san gabriel cultural show street whatever like it was like an egregious Dragon right. Boat, like the Dragon Boat Festival example that you right. you included. Um, what what for you? What allowed you to move past that and just like focus on what you were getting out of it personally? Yeah, yeah. Because there's so much more that goes on besides that. You know, yeah. yeah. You know, the actual real community work continues despite that. In conversation yeah. with that, but despite that. Yeah, it's, I, I think that that's a question that's going to come up more for us, especially as corporations have started to identify, well, have, have really even more identified Asian America as a demographic mm. um, that can be targeted and can be right. utilized as like a, a, a money-making audience. Um, I think especially right. in the wake of like the, like the crazy rich Asians of the world, um, we're, we're starting to become a community where more and more corporations are understanding that we have spending power and um, you mm -hmm. can, we have all of these existing organizations that are already doing great work. And if you just pay them way under rate, like they can do all the work for you. Uh, so I, 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 reading your book like that really, it really struck me like that, that, that kind of analysis really struck me because I think that that really is the question of, of Asian American art right now is who is it for and how do we ensure that we are clear on who it's for and how we're navigating it. Exactly. And before we go to another chat question, could I ask you to talk about Tuesday Night Cafe? Because I have surely uh, completely romanticized it in my own head, but, but to my mind, Tuesday Night Cafe is like this space that literally mostly exists beyond the reach of corporate multicultural capitalism, <laughs> you know, a, a space of true self-determination, you know, and community consultation. I mean, you know, this is what I love about it, but how do you think about it and how have you managed so, to- So Tuesday Night Cafe is a free Asian American public art series that started in the late 90s, um, very much um, out of need. Uh, it's, it, it was started by a woman named Tracy Kato Kidiyama and a bunch of her cohorts, a lot of folks who were doing work in Chinatown and, and historic Filipino town. Um, and it was very much created and inspired by um, a lot of like black art that was coming out, black art and gathering that was coming out of Luna Park and um, Chicano art and culture and gathering coming out of Borough Heights, in East LA. Um, and it was this desire to create a consistent Asian American scene at a time when Asian Americans really didn't have access to industry and so for artists like to sustain their work it was very hard um emo like like just logistically to like sustain your work if you can't get jobs but also it's hard to sustain your work if you don't have like a space to be in community with people so it was really about addressing that community need and also about creating something that would bring people into Little Tokyo um and so the way that we've operated we are now in our 20 we, this, this would have been our 21st season, 22nd season. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, free shows every first and third Tuesday of the month. I bring in about five to six artists um, to perform usually around the theme. And it, it's nobody is paid beyond our sound engineer. Um, it's really, for the artist, it's, we're, not, we're not a grant-run organization, so attendance numbers don't matter. So I'm really bringing artists in who I think could use the space, like could, mm. like would utilize it for their own practice, um, or who I think um, I would I would like to introduce to like a larger community. Um, 
So it, it does exist outside of that corporate multiculturalism in, uh, in, in concept and theory. I think um, that said, we're in a courtyard that is maintained by the nonprofits that operate within that courtyard and that mm -hmm. money is coming from somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think like we are, we live in LA uh, and so just the nature of like who shows up and is performing like I think that there we have to remember that everything is everything is tied to everything. So I I I think that for us in terms of the way that we operate and our approach is very, very much like we, we rejected corporate money before. Um we actually had a corporation offer to bankroll us. Really? And it down. Yeah. Um and so we've we've tried and even even like our largest donations usually come from individuals. Um mm -hmm. we don't we try not to hold ourselves accountable to even the nonprofits that we work with. Um, we will obviously support their work, um, but we, we, we don't want our own choices to be beholden to like larger interest. So um, we're intentionally small. And I think that a lot of that does mean that we exist outside of that, that corporate multiculturalism. But at the same time, we have to, we have to, remember that we live in a, a society <laughs> and and so and so by nature um we, we're tied mm -hmm. we're, we're everything is tied to everything but you can't really step outside you know that um, right but but yeah but and i really I, think you have gone as nearly you have ne as nearly done that as anyone could it's it's one I, I think like to what you were saying earlier about um taiko coming out of this this tradition that uh, or, or, or Taiko really finding a hold in, in, in Asian America in, during the Yellow Power Movement and, and sort of this 60s, 70s um, mm -hmm. era. I, I think for us, like, we're very much a team that's been mentored by those folks. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of the people who, are, who um, you've named in this book are, are folks who have helped, have, have, have like in some way or another helped steer the vision for Tuesday Night Cafe. Um, mm -hmm. There are folks on this call who right. I know have performed at Tuesday Night Cafe. Uh, so it's um it's a really it, who 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 uh, I I know I think the show's here I think Shiwei's performed oh, I believe okay okay Terry I don't think that Terry's performed yet oh um, wow that which change. is weird yeah. um but yeah uh, and then my my mom's here who co emceed with me once uh, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, cool 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 it's uh yeah I mean I I think that for for Asian Americans like that that sort of um we, we we can't operate in opposition to that like i think that if we create out of rejection that's we're just creating out of rejection and we're by by creating out of rejection we're centering that while we're rejecting um uh, uh, uh. and so it's it's a little complicated i think uh, it's very complicated it's yeah. very complicated and yeah. i think to your point yeah. it's like yeah the the festival may be bankrolled by target but mm. in the audience there's still somebody who may see Tycho for the first time and then that's it right so it's it's, Something it's, else it's layered and complicated and nothing is justification for anything but it's all it's all in there yeah yeah can i mention as in a really interesting moment i had at um tuesday night cafe in the fall um is it okay to mention milk connie lim oh of course okay yeah. um because she came on as a you know, decidedly unadvertised, unannounced um, performer mm -hmm. that night, right? Um, because of contract concerns, one could say, you know, but for me, it was like this moment where, you know, first of all, I, I was like, <laughs> kind of amused by my own fangirl response to her seeing her <laughs> up and, you yeah. know, oh my God. Um, um, you know, so at that level, I was, you know, sort of registering, you know, my, my own sort of, you know, my own pleasure was embedded in those very, you know, um, industry you know, um, the industry complex, right? You know, yeah. um, um, you know, I'd have been shaped by that, you know, but of course she is that and much, much more indeed, you know, and, and the fact that, that, that she had to sort of come in sub rosa, um, you know, is a very complicated and important um, dynamic that took place that night. Yeah, it's, uh, it, that's always been interesting for us because we are, like historically we're, we're super grassroots. It was like when I came on, staff about a decade ago now wow um i it was it was like 30 people in the audience 40 people in the audience everybody knew each other the performers were were very very much like 
kind of folks who who performed on the side. It, it was a lot of mm. folks who were like like professional practitioners, but that wasn't the main thing. And mm. over the course of the last decade, our audience has grown to about 150 to 200 people in the audience. Our, we have performers who are like like Milk Connie, like signed to labels, mm. which for us is very, very kind of new. And so it's come with new things that we have to navigate. Okay. Um, but like, yeah, even, even with Connie, like Milk, she's been performing with us probably for like seven, eight years. And that was the first time we had to do that. And um, and I was I was really happy that she has been able to sustain her art in that way. Mm -hmm. But I do also after I, it is also this moment of like, okay, then who, what what like yeah. if she if she is gigging all over the place, like what's our role in her her life, and like what's her role in our space? And I think I always just go back to like yeah. an artist like Connie still needs a Tuesday night cafe because we provide a space that exists exactly what you're saying outside of that, that corporate yeah. necessity. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the need is still there. Uh, it's just a matter of then how exactly. we, how we keep asserting our, how we meet that need as opposed to working in opposition to larger forces and like in, well said. Including, including what we're trying to do. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Oof. Maybe Oof. we should. Oh, yeah, we got questions. Yeah. We got questions. Um, <laughs> oh, and Terry, Terry, I love talking with Sean. <laughs> Terry, Terry did perform. Oh, yeah. Frank t Frank and Terry performed. I don't think that I was there for that because Frank, I was. Frank, really? Byron was in San Rio Tycho. Sorry. This is total. Okay. Frank, <laughs> Terry, we'll chat offline. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Everyone, San Rio Tycho is the UCR Tycho group, the collegiate group that's played Tycho on campus since 1998. They're amazing. And several. Uh, past and current present uh, members are right here. Yeah, Frank, okay, so Frank here, also who I met uh, when I was in college, maybe mm -hmm. during my one semester as a taiko player, um, mm -hmm. which is a fun story. I didn't know. I, yeah, so I, well, let me, uh, okay, let me tell the story really quick because I find it very funny in retrospect. Okay. Um, I, I joined, I went to USC and I wanted to join the taiko group. I also joined like five other clubs on campus, so eventually I had to drop it. But um, I got the dates wrong for the first um taiko uh practice uh -oh. and uh showed up and they practice they don't practice on campus they practice at senshin temple which um, is down the down the block mm -hmm. and i show up at senshin and this is my first time at this temple which would eventually become like the temple that i consider my home temple um and uh i i legit tried to break in because i thought that maybe i had just there was like a locked door somewhere <laughs> And so it was the sketchiest thing um, I've ever done in my life. Uh, but yeah, that was my introduction. That was my introduction to uh, Kazan Taiko. Uh, so there's a question I don't want you to in the there's a question that yeah, you might sure have missed. Oh, what do you uh, think are the major Catherine, threads? Oh, yes. Uh, so yeah, so from Catherine Lee, what, what do you think are the major threads that connect all of your books and research projects? And what is your next research project? Oh my God, oh, Catherine, thanks a lot for a huge question. Catherine Lee, ethnomusicologist at UCLA. Oh, I think you're in Michigan right now. Um, um, well, ooh, huh. um, um, you know, it's not as if there's one tidy thread that, that has carried me through and will continue to, um, um, but, 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 but definitely, um, um, well, I think the connections between speak it louder and louder and faster are pretty pretty obvious and clear. Um, I, I do think that um, I was making certain discoveries in my first book, which was my dissertation, you know, back in the day, uh, the, the project in Bangkok where I was looking at uh, musicians' rituals. Um, um, that was the moment when I began to think about difference. And it was totally not at that point in time in the mid, -19, mid to late 1980s difference was really not on the radar for ethnomusicology as a discipline. Um, and I was beginning to think about gender. And, and so all of that began to crystallize uh, um, during the writing of the dissertation. Um, so kind of set the stage, you know, for then my sharp left turn <laughs> into Asian American studies and, and American studies. Yeah, yeah. My current project, I have two current projects. Um, one is a, a book that's still very much uh, in process underway um, um, about um, 
um, race and voice in ethnomusicology as a discipline. Um, I'm thinking about the ways in which liberal humanism has, has shaped our discipline and the ways in which it has continued to hold us back from anything that might remotely be called decolonial thought. Okay, so that's sort of long story short because it's, it's, it's still underway. I've written about three chapters. Um, actually more than that, but still. Um, the other thing I'm doing is that I'm in the very late stages of um, editing Nobuko Miyamoto's memoir. Uh, she's, she's, um, she's written the story of her life um, and it's incredible. Um, so it will come out through the University of California Press probably next year. Um, and I'm, I'm in the very uh, painful process of cutting 20,000 words out of it, you know, and trying to make those tough decisions. Um, so that's a different kind of work, which at this point, uh, you know, and I can given where I am in my, my career, um, it doesn't have to be about me and mine all the time. I, I, you know, I have a certain kind of privilege of being able to direct my creative and critical energies towards work that isn't, you know, mine, right? Thanks for asking. What is what does a how do you cut twenty thousand words out of a book? Like what for you is is that just? Oh, that's the question. <laughs> uh, I I I what I think I'm doing is um, taking entire chapters and thinking about trying to have Nobuko publish them elsewhere. Because mm -hmm. you definitely can't get rid of twenty thousand words by taking a sentence or a phrase here and there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have trouble with like five words. I don't know how you do twenty thousand. So, yeah, it's not um, easy. Yeah, so we are we are at it's one oh eight. We I think we have the room until one thirty. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we will answer them um, as we start to as we head into our our final stretch. Yeah. Um, Shall we? But uh, oh yeah, do we have another question here? There are quite a quite a few here. Maybe Judy Lee. So, oh, here we go. Yeah. UCR librarian. Um, so, oh no, I think this is Julie saying that she has to leave. It's fine. <laughs> question. Okay. Yes, at the bottom. Um, uh, yeah, so your book is freely accessible across platforms, meaning it is truly open access. Um, what drove you to do this and was it easy to negotiate? I remember you, you mm, actually approaching me, you, you're telling me about that really early on. Like, like, so I think that that's been part of your process from the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, um, more and more university presses have an open access option. You know, the majority of books are still published in a way where you have to pay for it if you want to read it in whatever form. Um, the University of California Press uh, premiered their uh, open access online born digital series called Luminos, um, I don't know, more than five years ago at this point. Um, so they were in the, the, you know, one of the front runners uh, to experiment with this. I knew from the beginning that, you know, given the fact that this book, you know, sure I wrote it, but it's not my own. I mean, it reflects the, the, the hopes and, and the um, stories of so many different people. Uh, I wanted it to be available to the Tycho community, so to speak. Um, so I knew from the beginning that's how I wanted to publish it. Um, this doesn't happen for free. Somebody literally still has to pay the press in order to uh, cover all the production costs, right? So the way the model works for most um, scholarly open access books is that um, you turn to uh, your dean, you know, or someone on your campus to ask for um, help with that. And there are also sometimes publication subventions that you can get through scholarly organizations, right? Um, but even though the book is now free to readers, it doesn't mean that it's produced for free. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so, you know, basically I had to put that together and I was lucky enough to have the deep support, you know, of um, my department and my dean at UCR. I'm grateful. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I like that that note you just said about it sort of belonging to all the story the, all the people whose stories you were telling. What what has the response been like from the people? I'm not totally sure. I mean, people say nice things, you know, when we cross paths. Um, you know, I would really love to hear, you know, some of the responses that are less polite. Maybe uh, you know because it's it's meant the book is meant to. I don't want to say it's not. I didn't mean it to be like provoking, you know, at that level. But, um, you know, I definitely want it to be a think piece, right? Um, so, so as much as any author likes to hear that people enjoyed my book, you know, I also would really like to have the conversation, you know, that, that um, is the one I think the Tycho community 
needs, right? So I'd love to I, hear more. Yeah. And I mean, I think you do such a beautiful job of addressing some of the, the thornier topics in a really, um, in a very thorough, but very respectful kind of way. Um, I, 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 I think one thing that um, you, you sort of talk about in here also, like just to sort of take the conversation in another direction with that in mind, um, you, you kind of talk about how uh, Taiko is part of an assertive new Asian American sensibility um, which feels to me very intuitive. Um, how important is it, do you think that Asian Americans, for Asian Americans to understand like the history of Taiko and like the history of it in like an Asian American context? Like what, what do you think that value that adds? Um, do you think that that's something that's like a nice to have? And I, I think I know your answer. I'm leading you to the one here. But like, but like I, I, am, I, I am curious like how you would, how you, you would articulate that though. Yeah. Because I think that we say like history matters a lot, yeah. but we oftentimes don't back that up. Mm. True enough. Um, it's essential, you know, I'm going to say that it's absolutely essential, you know, especially, come on, at this historical moment when, when you know, history is being erased and rewritten, you know, on an on a hourly basis, right? Um, you know, but for Asian Americans in particular, because it, it, it was such a struggle even to, um, find spaces in which to put our narratives and our histories forward, right? Um, you know, why, why did the Asian American community go nuts over the last few weeks as Renee Tajima Pena's, you know, five hour documentary was aired on PBS, you know? Um, you know, the importance of seeing our narratives put together, knowing our history, um, you know, just not to say that those histories are stable, you know, or fully articulated, you know? These are all long processes, right? Yeah, it's essential. For sure, for sure, for sure. Um, I guess uh, if we are out of time, I mean, I would, I would love to keep talking with you, but I feel like the more we talk, the more granular it's gonna get. And then at a certain point, we're yeah. just gonna be gossiping. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I, I guess like one, to, to, to bring it back to the book, like you, the, the first word here is pain, like louder and faster. And then it's, they're sort of talking about pain and joy. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the importance of pain and like where the importance of pain in not only your text, but then also your own practice as a Taiko practitioner and sort of where that's, how that's like shaped to your thinking? Oh, yeah. Um... For whatever reason, I noticed that that's, that's a chapter that's getting um, attention, you know, so I suspect it, um, it resonates, you know, in the ways that I, I meant it to, I hope, um, which is that pain is both, um, pain's a lot of things. Pain is experienced at the individual level. Pain can be experienced physically, psychologically, spiritually. Um, pain, um, some have written, um, can literally obliterate the sense of self. Um, of course, Elaine Scarry is one of the main folks who have written par powerfully about um, um, pain as a phenomenon um, from a humanities perspective. Um, the pain is also experienced by communities, obviously. It is not only at the individual level. Um, pain changes subjectivities. Um, pain is centrally part of Tycho praxis and um, you know, as I write about, we Tycho players love to talk about, you know, our blisters and our aches. Um, and there's a really fierce pride taken, you know, as well as kind of, you know, self-amusement, you know, why are we doing this to ourselves, you know, kind of thing. Um, but then there's also the understanding um, for those of us who, who want to re remember and think of Tycho as a Japanese American practice, um, you know, that it is inevitably tied into the incarceration, the World War II incarceration, that that, that pain, that level of structural uh, pain is, is at some level built into the tradition. And of course, my worry is that that gets forgotten or set aside or remembered only by some, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, neither you or I are in the business of um, wanting to live in pain all the time, but, but we also know that um, you're carrying those understandings and memories and the power of pain forward is um, super important, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we have a question from Shiwei. Uh, really? One of, one, of, one of my favorite things about your writing in general, Dr. Wong, is your usage of descriptive language. They often carry a kinetic energy that I do not often associate with academic writing. Can you share a little bit how you developed your unique voice and which authors, authors slash authors have influenced you the most? Ah, really? Um, thanks for the question, really Wu. Um, uh, uh, UCR alum, amazing taiko player. He's been in any number of taiko groups. He's now um, an artist and uh, has recently put out his, his first uh, full-length album, uh, Red Eye to Tokyo. I love it. Um, which he plays taiko and, and, and a bunch of other instruments. Um, um, luckily for me, there are any number of great models for um, writing that uh, Kinetic energy, thank you. But I mean, you know, those of us who choose to write about performance as performance, right? To, to literally go in close to the details of performance practice. Um, so there are a number of great, 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 great models, many of them coming from performance studies, but not entirely. Um, so, so again, you know, I am indebted. I acknowledge um, I'm doing a citational practice here of saying that there are, um, you know, real people I've drawn on to get to where I am, certainly from ethnomusicology, folks like Michelle Kisliuk, folks like uh, Steve Feld, um, you know, but many others uh, besides uh, from critical dance studies as well, you know. And by the way, everybody, I've written about Willie in um, um, an article that I published separately um, as a journal article uh, about him and our teacher, our shared teacher, Reverend Tom, uh, about them performing in the, um, Coldplay's Princess of China music video. And so Willie was kind enough to let me, uh, Shi Wei, Willie Wu, was kind enough to let me uh, um, interview him at great length about his experiences and thoughts and reflections on that experience of playing in that music video. So thanks for the question, Willie. Um, any, any other, oh, here we go. Uh, Will you be having other book events where you can convey your messages about Tycho to non-ethnomusicologists using these events specifically to further the message of Tycho? <laughs> the message of Tycho, carry it forward. <laughs> I'd also like to say, if you couldn't tell, I am very much not an ethnomusicologist, so I, I hope that I have, I have passed it off. <laughs> I, 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 hey, ethnomusicologists are my people, but I'm happy to say that I have more than one people, right? You know, and so I very much wanted the book to speak, you know, across, you know, I, th I think I mostly succeeded. Um, um, do I have other book events? Um, Connie, thank you for asking. Um, I've mostly only given book talks at universities over the, you know, it's the book came out last September. So I, you know, I had a bunch of those lined up. Um, I'm being pushed by uh, Quetzal Flores, you know, of the band Quetzal. He's like, he's saying I really need to give some readings, whether they're actually readings, but some sort of events in the community, not on, on college university campuses. And he is right. So that's something I need to, to work on as soon as um, uh, our world reopens. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. asking, Connie. I, th I think that that, that uh, yeah, I, th I think one thing that is really beautiful about your book, and I would encourage everybody to read it um, if you haven't had a chance yet, but it, it does, even though it, it is very thorough in, in, in its research and, and there's very much, it's a very, there's a very academic lens to it. Like it's also just so beautifully written. Um, your transition, the way that you use transitions um, mm -hmm. in this very poetic kind of way, uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of, of music throughout it that I think to, to Willie Shiwa's point um, doesn't, you don't often see in academic writing. Um, okay. And I, 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 really, I really appreciated that and thought that, that that made it very easy for me as a, a lay person to, to read it and understand it and, and really think about it and really think about what you're saying in relation to the sure. world we're living in right now. Yeah. Great, I'm glad, I'm glad. It's great. Yeah, thank you, yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so okay. with that, yeah. I mean, I think that we're, I think that we can start to wrap it up. If there are any last questions, please feel free to drop them in. But, um, if not, then this has been incredible, Professor Wong. Thank you so much for having me. That's for me. For, for making your time to for us. Sean, Sean, thank you so much.
can we could continue our late night texting back and forth we'll, having we'll deep conversations? We'll keep talking about okay. yes, we're we are we're sharing we're sharing sources, we're reading things. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, oh, thank you. But again, if you haven't checked out her book, here it is: Louder and Faster, Pain, Joy, and the Biopolitics and Asian American Taiko, available from University of California Press. <laughs> um, you can also get it for free, uh, free ninety nine on the internet. Mm, um, several, several places. Several several places. Uh, so please take a look. And what's great about the online edition is that there's also a companion website that has a number of photos and videos, um, a lot of material that um, Professor Wong has 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 curated um, in relation to the book. So it's it's very much an immersive experience. Highly highly recommend it. Um, and with that, I guess I'll pass it back to Georgia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you so much, Sean. This was terrific. What a lovely lunchtime discussion. And we look forward to hosting more of these. So stay tuned. All right. Thank you. Thank you, CIS. Thank you, thank friends, you so for coming. Yeah, thank okay. you all for joining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Congratulations, Deborah. Thank you. Great job. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, Walter. I know. You bet. Bye. Oh, he's me. <laughs> to be continued. Bye, Deborah. Thank Bye. you. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for coming. <laughs>